Okay, we, we are going to pick up where we left off, except today we're going to focus our opening discussion on Newton's universal law of gravitation. Now, just to remind you that uh, Newton came after Kepler, and while he subscribed to the heliocentric model, he was bothered by why Kepler's laws worked, and he spent a great deal of time developing his three laws of motion and came to the realization that perhaps the reason why objects move the way they move on Earth, um, his first law of inertia, his second law equating the acceleration to the, the amount of force and mass, and his third law, his law of equal and opposite forces, he started to realize perhaps that those could be applied to the heavens. And when he developed the universal law of gravitation, this was truly um, and still remains to be one of the uh, most revolutionary laws because it's the first time that somebody had proposed that the behavior of the motions on Earth would follow the same laws, the same physical laws as the behavior of the motion of the objects in the heavens. Uh, sometimes the universal law of gravitation is called the uh, the mutual law of gravitation because there's always mutual forces of attraction. Every time one force acts, there's an equal and opposite force. And so Newton said that these mutual forces of attraction, they act between every pair of masses in the universe. And if you just stop and think about that, that means every mass attracts every mass. That means this, this pen is pulling on my binder. That means Pluto is pulling on you right now. That means my coffee mug, by virtue of its mass alone, is somehow attracted to me at a distance. And why would this work? Um, how does it know it's there? How does the moon recognize where the earth is and how much mass the earth has? How does it know? How does the sun have a sense that there are planets nearby that it can pull and keep in orbit? There's a lot of questions that remain, but as Newton started to play around with his law, he started to say, okay, the reason why objects fall on Earth, the Earth pulls them down. That's a mutual force of attraction. An apple falls from the tree is the most classic example. And he, he, he proposed that that's the same reason why the moon falls towards the Earth and around the Earth. The shape of the orbit, while it's not a straight line like an, you know, dropping an object that falls as a vertical straight line down towards the center of the earth, it is still a force of attraction. And he said this force of attraction, which we now call gravity, um, acts to pull each object towards a common center because gravity, roughly translated, means center seeking. Uh, everything is seeking a common center. And if you think about that, that's why the largest masses in the universe, planets, stars, are round, are spherical. Because as you apply gravitational forces towards a common center and you start to apply those around all particles of any mass, it'll begin to push in a symmetrical way that's equidistant from a common center, which is by definition a sphere. Um, objects that aren't quite large enough don't become spherical in shape. And Gravity is pulling smaller masses towards larger masses because while those forces of attraction are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction, the objects with more mass have more inertia, so they, they move less, they accelerate less, and the objects with less mass have less inertia. Therefore, they experience a greater acceleration. So these mutual forces of attraction are acting between every mass and every pair of masses in the universe, pulling them towards their common center. So if we model one mass is m1, a second mass is m2, separated by a distance r, measured from center to center of masses, then there are two forces acting. Mass 2 pulls on mass 1, and in return, mass 1 pulls on mass 2. And these two forces, uh, as represented by the vectors here, are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. The larger mass, of course, responds with a by moving less, a smaller acceleration. There's an inverse relationship there in accordance with the second law. And the smaller mass, uh, which receives the same amount of force in return, will move more. That's why the moon orbits the Earth, not the Earth orbiting the moon. That's why the 
the Earth orbits the Sun and not the Sun orbiting the Moon. It's not because one, one mass is receiving more force. They're receiving equal amounts of force, pulling them towards a common center. And it turns out the common center between any two masses, if one is relatively small by comparison to the other, that common center is, is, is roughly <laughs> near the center of the larger mass. Like the common center of mass between the Earth and the Sun is, is still inside the Sun. Um, and we're going to explore that common center a little bit more. So as Newton started to propose this law, uh, he developed this relationship that the force uh, of gravity is proportionate to the product of the two masses. That is to say that if you have more mass, you have more force, but it's inversely proportionate to the square of the distance between them. That's the R squared. And if you measure with SI units, your masses in kilograms, your distance in meters, uh, your force in newtons, then you can actually equate the magnitude of these values using this proportionality constant, which took quite a bit of time to figure out what this was, the universal gravitation constant, G, capital G, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Now, this should all look somewhat familiar to you by now. We, we, we introduced this last uh, class period, and uh, some of you spent some time, most of you spent some time studying these forces, Newton's laws, and universal gravitation in your physics course. So my question for you today in the opening discussion is this. As you're kind of wrapping your minds around this universal law of gravitation, which, which is the foundation for all of Newtonian mechanics that we're going to study, give me a reason why this law can help explain Kepler's second and third laws. So remember, Kepler's second law says that objects, planets orbiting the sun, uh, move faster when they're closer to the sun, and then move slower when they're further from the sun. And Kepler's third law says that uh, the larger the orbital radius, the larger the orbital period. So Mercury, which is the closest to the sun, has the smallest period, and Saturn, the furthest from the sun of the known planets at the time, has the longest period. How can this model support that? Because Newton was troubled that Kepler's laws were purely empirical laws. They had no theoretical basis. They just were based on observation alone. Now Newton wants to propose a universal theory to explain this and to explain any orbiting system. In the discussion post today, give me, give me the reasons for this, how this can be used to support Kepler's second and third law.